Uh, Grace Thompson is the executive director of the 1851 Center for Constitutional Law, which is a public interest law firm right here in Columbus, dedicated to protecting the constitutional rights of Ohio citizens from government abuse. Mr. Thompson has directed the 1851 Center of Buckeye Institute for Public Policy Solutions uh, prior to this, uh, prior to being incorporated as a separate entity. Previously, Mr. Thompson has served as an attorney for the Sam Adams Foundation in Chicago. He's practiced privately in, Chicago, in Illinois and Ohio, and he's a clerk for the Ohio Judiciary. Uh, Mr. Thompson has also successfully litigated cases in the Supreme Court of Ohio, as well as intermediate courts of appeal and courts of common pleas throughout the state. Mr. Thompson has litigated constitutional issues related to property rights, voting rights, regulation, taxation, corporate welfare, search and seizures, and smoking bans. He's the author of Presuming Liberty, Using Ohio's Constitution to Limit Government, Defending Liberty in Ohio, A Roadmap for Protecting Freedom and Limiting Government with the State Constitution, and Before to the Ohio Pocket Constitution. Uh, Mr. Thompson has been a regular guest on state and national programs, including Freedom Watch, which was held right across the street in March of 2010. Um, I remember a lot of you guys were there. I was there. Um, and Mr. Thompson is a native Ohioan who studied law at Case Western in Cleveland. With that, please join me in welcoming Maurice Thompson. Than the federal counterpart in the Fifth 
Amendment. Secondly, the language can be analogous to the federal constitution, but slightly different. There are other parts of the Ohio Constitution, for example, that say private property rights shall be held inviolate. This is a stronger term than the term used in the federal constitution, and so this is a residuary for greater protection of property rights than we have at the federal level. And third, there are certain state constitution provisions that are more, they're completely different from their federal counterparts. Um, for example, Section 1, Article 1 of the Ohio Constitution appears to protect basically natural rights. It indicates all men are, by nature, free and independent and have certain inalienable rights. Among these are enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and seeking and obtaining happiness and safety. Now that sounds like nothing in the federal constitution that you've heard. It sounds more like the Declaration of Independence. It's basically a declaration of natural rights, and this is the very first section of the Ohio Constitution. So you can see we're handling a very different document here, but it's not just in a you know, heady philosophical sense. It's also true on the ground. For example, the Ohio Constitution prohibits corporate bailouts. Uh, the government's not allowed to lend your money to corporations for their own benefit. Um, <clears throat> there are property tax caps in Article 12, other kinds of tax caps elsewhere. And Section 2 of Article 1, believe it or not, actually uh, allows you to retain your right to abolish government in Ohio if you so choose. We actually had a useful exercise upon this last year in the village of Amelia, where citizens were able to vote on whether to abolish the village government in Amelia, Ohio, down by Cincinnati. So and there are a myriad of other things. The, the document is much longer than the federal constitution, so there are a myriad of other protections. Um, and the important lesson here is something of federalism. This is essentially, it's called new federalism or Brennan federalism. It's the idea that the federal constitution merely provides a floor for the protection of your constitutional rights. And that states are completely unobstructed in going above and beyond that floor and providing a greater protection of your rights than is provided by the federal constitution. What they really can't do is the opposite. They can't institute slavery or uh, instigate other legislation that violates the federal constitution. So that's the baseline protection of rights. The states can go above and beyond. And uh, this is a, the part of federalism that's often forgotten by you know, those who are probably against the federalism themselves. Now, to understand the smoking ban issue, we really have to take a step back and recognize why we have no federal constitutional claim when challenging something like the state smoking ban. And again, we've all already kind of learned this, or, or about to learn this. Um, the question is, how do we get to this place where the federal constitution offers so little protection for property rights and absolutely no cause of action for us if we were to challenge the federal constitution in federal court. Well, it didn't start that way. It, it's well recognized that the federal constitution, just like our state constitution, has its roots in Lockean philosophy. The Ohio Supreme Court actually indicated in 2006 there are Lockean notions of property rights in the Ohio constitution, so it looks to that political philosophy when protecting property rights. And what, what is that? What is Lockeanism? If you're going to take political philosophy or haven't otherwise encountered it, the first principle of John Locke's treatise of government is self-ownership. The notion is that you are born with certain rights that are inherent in your humanity. You uh, own your mind, you own your hands, you own your faculties. You apply those faculties to property, and that is essentially what makes the property yours. You're born into this world with the name of time and uh, your, in your body, in your mind. And when you apply those, those faculties to different endeavors, different types of property, that property becomes yours. And that is the first principle of government, is that government is formed to protect those things that are yours, to protect your individual rights. So the individual is supreme over the collective. This is in contrast to the other prevailing view at the time of the founders, which is an Aristotelian view, the idea that we're all in this together, that the collective should supersede individual rights. Um, essentially the idea that government is nothing but a larger family and that the leader of government is the same as a, a father sovereign. Uh, it's called paternalism or patriarchal system. 
And sometimes you hear, you hear the term aristocrat, where that derives from is the notion that uh, an individual believes that he knows better uh, what's better for you than you know for yourself. And that's where the term aristocrat originally derives from this Aristotelian philosophy. Um, so it begins with self-ownership, and then we trade some of these rights that we have uh, in exchange for protection from the government. But not just any kind of protection, not for amenities, not for a more pleasant life, <laughs> but protection from those that would assault our rights. And this essentially is what is known as the police power in Locke's world, and also by our founders. The notion that the government can use force against others who are about to use force or have already used force against you, but only in those limited circumstances. Now, this philosophy is very evident in the Declaration of Independence, which indicates uh, you know, government is secure to protect the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it's also evident in the federal constitution's original meaning through the Ninth Amendment, the Tenth Amendment, and the doctrine of enumerated powers, which creates essentially islands of government power in a sea of individual rights, rather than the opposite. And it's the opposite that is really prominent today, unfortunately. Up until the progressive era, constitutional law, particularly as applied to the regulation of property rights, was effectively governed by the kind of precedent we saw in a case called Munn versus Illinois. And that's the idea that in order to regulate something, it has to be clothed with the public interest. It has to be inextricably intertwined with the public interest so that externalities are everywhere with its operation. And you know, Chief Justice Tapp from here in Ohio indicated that if the common callings are clothed with public interest by mere legislative declaration, there must be a revolution in the relation of government to general business. And this is all through the 1800s. Uh, this is consistent with what's characterized as the Lochner era by your constitutional law professors. Well, we had this, and indeed there was uh, a revolution in the relation of government to general business. And this revolution arose in the progressive era, which essentially eviscerated many constitutional protections at the federal level. The kind of uh, intellectual father of the progressive movement in many ways was Woodrow Wilson. And you could see through his philosophy how he was careful in appointing judges that agreed with him and really kind of pushing an agenda that has gotten us to where we are today on economic rights and property rights. As opposed to Lockeanism, here are some quotes from Wilson. The limits of a written constitution should only apply to the era of the people who wrote it and instead, government powers must be adapted to the interests of the people. So this is the first clear articulation of the concept of a living, breathing constitution versus an originalist view of the constitution that views it as a social contract, which was Locke's idea. Locke's idea is that people trade certain rights for certain protections, and we put that in writing so that we're very clear on what those rights and protections are, and that is the constitution. Wilson, on the other hand, claimed the social contract theory places an unfounded emphasis on the individual. And one of his most interesting quotes is that the old constitutional order was standing in the way of progress. He viewed the Constitution as Darwinian and, and claimed his critics were actually Newtonian. You know, he believed in an evolving Constitution while they believed in a, a Constitution fixed, like the rules of physics, and hence the phrase Newtonian. And FDR was of the same ilk. He characterized the federal constitution as some relic of the horse and buggy era. And so they appointed judges like Louis Brandeis, who you know, some of your professors may think is a hero or an idol. But yeah, here, here's a quote from Brandeis on property rights. The rights of property and the liberty of the individual must be remolded from time to time to meet changing needs of society. And of course, originalists would say, you know, if you want to remold rights, we have a way to do that. It's the, the amendment process in the federal constitution in Article 5. But and instead, the judges of the New Deal era took this upon themselves to remold our rights in order to allow our politicians to remold our society to increase the breadth of government. And two prominent cases that really speak to this issue that you've either already studied or are about to study, Nebbia and Caroline products. Uh, Nebbia was the case in 1934 in the New Deal era that essentially overturned